Thank you. It's good to be here. Um, so Canvas Founders Fund is a team of 10 students, four of them from the University of Utah, five from BYU, and me from Utah Valley University. Um, yeah, woo-woo. And hopefully I'm going to transition that a little bit and take over the world. And Utah Valley University will take the full 10 spots. Um, what we do is we come in to invest in student-run companies before they're probably an investment for anybody else. And so you may think that you're not ready as a company, that you just have an idea or that you're working on something and it's not making money, that you're not generating revenue. And our goal is to basically help you get there. So either we give you money and help you get there through the money, or we give you mentorship, we give you guidance, and help you get to that next round where you can actually find a venture capitalist that wants to invest in you. But I think venture capital is something that's kind of thrown around. People talk about it a lot, and I don't think everybody knows exactly what it is. So who watches Shark Tank? Yeah, OK. So a lot of us watch Shark Tank. Who watches The Bachelor? Proud. I'm very proud of the men who proud. raised their hands for that. How about Survivor? Anybody seen Survivor? So the way we compare venture capital is if you were to try and date the way that The Bachelor dates, you probably wouldn't be very successful, right? If you tried to go camping the way Survivor is, you probably wouldn't be very successful. The same thing is true of watching Shark Tank to think about pitching to an investor. It's really just entertainment. It has a few things that you can learn from it that are good value, I guess. But more than anything, it's entertainment and it's fun that way. And so what we wanted to do today is actually talk to you a little bit about what investors really want to hear. And then as we go through the pitches, I handed out the sheets of paper. We want you to kind of evaluate the pitches and tell us what you think. Tell us what you actually see in those companies and whether or not you'd invest money in those companies. So first of all, the team. So, because this is actually really cool to get to do because this is what we've been learning for just for the last couple of months while we've been investing in teams. But I think we've heard over 30 pitches. So we've been looking at people in a very analytical way. Um, but it really breaks down to this. Like we have people come in and give us all kinds of like crazy narratives of what they're doing and what they're trying to accomplish in their world-changing vision. But really, the things that we're focusing on is is these these things on these on this paper. Um, so it'll be a really cool opportunity for you guys to kind of watch the way we watch and listen for the things that we listen to. But so first things first, talking about the team, especially at the level that you guys are at, the level that we're looking for, we're not going to have there's not going to be like huge margins, uh, huge sales, anything like that, lots of revenue, because you guys are st like startups, almost like pre-startups, right? You have an idea, you have maybe a little bit of traction. So what we're really investing in is your team. If you have the right people and the right skill sets and the right experience, and if you don't, you know the people that do, right? Like if you have a technical idea, but you don't know how to program, you know the programmer who's going to help you do that, that kind of thing. We want to make sure that your team is in the right place. Um, <clears throat> and then you're looking at the market. And this is interesting for us because this is just a ton of Google. Honestly, while we're sitting in presentations, if you look at the people's computers on the team while this person is pitching, We'll just Google their idea, right? And if somebody hasn't gone as far to do that, then that's kind of a red flag. If you haven't Googled your competition or your idea to see who else is kind of in the space that you're in, that's nerve wracking. And so that's like, and so this question kind of figuring out like if people really want what you have, that's a really important question. Even just talking to your friends and figuring out would you use this or would you buy that or would you do that or whatever, things like that. So next is the competition. And again, we're basically doing this while someone's going through their pitch. Um, we're trying to Google this, find out who's out there. Um, you know, If you're a company that's talking about building a duster, we're out there finding out what the cost of a Swiffer duster is, right? How much money are they making? How much is that market? Can you overtake the Swiffer duster? Um, is that going to work for you? And so competition is a big thing of whether or not you can actually do that, and if you have a reason that you can take over for the competition. So maybe you're a smaller company, maybe you're something else, but do you have an advantage that's going to allow you to do something new and exciting in that market? So next is the burn rate and your cash needs. And so burn rate refers to how fast you're actually spending capital. So if you've, we've seen companies that have come in and they've won a lot of competitions or they had a grandma who really liked them and wanted to give them $50,000 and they spent that and they have nothing to show for it, well, that's probably not a good investment for us, right? You haven't built anything. You don't have a prototype. You basically you know, sat on a couch and played Halo with your friends and called it a startup, is what it looks like to us. Um, I threw this up here, and I actually kind of laughed at it, that I think of the fact that the Joker talked about um, that his needs were very cheap, right? He needed gasoline to explode things. And so the same thing applies to startups, that 
the cheaper you can do things, the better you can do them as just kind of bootstrapping them and pulling up, you know, whatever you can, calling on friends, calling on family, finding those resources wherever you can. If you're not spending money, that looks really good to us. I think one more thing just to add on to that, like this idea, we've seen people come in who have got, who've won, you know, twenty, thirty thousand dollars in competition money and they don't have anything to show for it. We've had some people come in that have ten thousand dollars in competition money and they have a prototype and they have a website and they have some uh, marketing or whatever, but it's not so much like the scale that you're operating at, like at least for Campus Founders Fund, for those of you who have an idea who want to come pitch to us, we want to meet you. We have business cards that I'm dying to give away. Um, but if you want to come talk to us, it's not so much we want to see that you've won a couple of thousand dollars or that you have a functional prototype. We just want to see that whatever resources you've gotten, you've used them effectively. If you've been on your idea for a week and you have a website built, like that shows us that the few resources you have and the little uh, limited amount of time you've been given, you've done a lot with that. So that's all we're trying to see is what kind of resources you have. Um, and then finally, scalability. So this is a really good, Isaac put a really good kind of uh, explanation, just how well you can go from 100 to 1,000 to a million customers. If this is something like you, you knit something really cool, but you're the only one who knows how to knit it and you refuse to teach anybody else, that's not scalability, right? Things like that, figuring out how it's not to where it goes from just you doing something cool, but your time and your resources are really stretched. So it's figuring out how you're, going to how you're going to go into different venues, whether it's manufacturing or partners or whatever, whatever you're going to have to do to make it so that you can go from 100 to 1,000 to a million clients. So that's the other idea that we're looking for, because if you can only ever get to 100 clients and then that's it, there's, nothing, there's no growth, there's no exit strategy for you there. And along with that, do you have to hire a new employee for every 10 customers you bring on? Now that may be a great business opportunity, but it's not particularly super scalable. And so just trying to figure out how fast can you grow if the market really loves what you're building and what you're throwing at them, how hard is it for you to do that? Can you throw on another 100 customers? Does that take a week? Does that take a month? Do you have to train new staff? Do you have to get a new manufacturing facility? All of that goes into scalability. <clears throat> and so just as far as like, so these are kind of the big things that we look for when we're hearing a pitch and stuff. And as we go through the two pitches today, we'll give feedback, but you'll notice like these are the things we're looking at. We'll ask questions about different ideas and things that you thought of, questions you've asked yourself. But as far as what, who we are as a resource, it's not just that you have an idea. If you make us happy, we give you 20 grand. This is all about trying to promote entrepreneurship in Utah. That's the whole mission statement of Campus Founders Fund. And so even if we don't feel like we want to give you money right now, we want to give you support. <clears throat> Just last night, we had a pitch meeting. We heard three pitches. We sent our first candidate to what we're affectionately calling our Campus Founders Labs. And this is somebody who, honestly, it would, it would probably hurt him professionally to get 20, just randomly get $20,000 because he's not in the place to get it. But I was put in charge of the team to help him find the resources and the mentors, the connections, people like that, that would really help him get to the point where he would need 20000 to be able to really explode. So even if you have an idea, you're not really sure like if it's worth $20,000 or whatever, this is honestly like all you waste is a time. You drive up to pitch to us. You come talk to 10 super talented people who have a lot of experience, a lot of connections. And even if, they, even if your idea is not where it needs to be, you get 10 people's feedback about your idea. Like, so you're 10 people's opinions richer, and that's a really valuable thing. So those are the kind of resources that we're trying to give you. And I showed that team picture at the beginning of the 10 different members on the team. And beyond just being from different schools, we have people that are engineering, medical students, uh, business students, finance students. So we really run a lot of different things. We know a lot about the different companies that are coming in. Um, we can give advice, we can give help in that way, and then connect you to other resources that we have, as well as we're funded by Kickstart Seed Fund. And so all of the companies that they have and that they've invested millions of dollars into, we have the ability to call on their CEOs to come help you if that is necessary, if that's needed. So really reach out to us if you have questions, if you're not sure if you're ready, we hope that you come and tell us that you are questioning it and we can get you ready to come pitch to us. So without much, too much further ado, um, I think we're kicking over to XStock and their pitch and we'll go through that and let them tell you what they're doing. So thank you guys, it's great to be here. If you have questions, we're gonna be here after as well, so. Are you plugging in your laptop? What? Are you plugging in your laptop or did you have it up? Oh, do we have an HDMI cord? And I will be timing your pitches when you're ready to go. You've got 10 minutes. I've got 10 minutes? Yeah. Cool.
that that's your computer. Right? Yep. <laughs> but I can't get the case open. And don't worry, I didn't bring a gun. <laughs> Believe me, carrying this thing through the halls, I had a couple people look at me like I'd already shot them. <laughs> There's the combo. What am I supposed to do with this? <laughs> All right, well, I guess we're going to have to do without it. I mean, that sucks. All right, let's start then. All right, so my name is Blake Johnson. I'm here representing... Wait for it. There it is. So I'm here representing my company, X-Stock. Um, X-Stock, what we do... Well, let me, let me kind of give you um, the history of how we got started. So... Me and my family, we, we are long-time hunters. We ha it's, it's a passion of ours, and it's something that we love doing. Um, and coming from an old, um, an old friend gave me, gave me some advice. As you're looking for a career, do something that you're passionate in. And that's something that's always driven me and something that I've always searched for. We got looking at gun stock. This has been made the same way and out of the same material since guns were invented, pretty much, you know? Um, so what we wanted to do is we wanted to reinvent this gun stock and make it, make it better. So what, what we did is we started with this gun, it's the Ruger 1022. How many of you heard of the Ruger 1022? How many of you have a 1022? A lot of you. <laughs> um, so just a little... Um, information on the 1022. They started making them in 64. To date, they've sold over 8 million of them. Um, and it's one of the most popular guns in the, in the world and one of the most user, modif user modified guns in the world as well. Um, for an aftermarket stock for the Ruger 1022, um, this is kind of what our market looks like and the market share that's just and how it's distributed. As you can see, there's a couple different players, um, but when I look at this, I'm excited because there's not one company that owns the majority of the share. There's not one company that owns 50% or 25% or that it's, it's something that you can enter and not have a whole lot of barriers. So what, what makes the X stock different? And I really wish I could get that thing out of there. <coughs> So you can see it. So the X stock, it's not only we, it's not only got a cool design, but it's also, you know, it, it's got a pretty face, but it also works hard. It's extremely utilitarian in the fact we've made it out of an ISO grid pattern, and what we're able to do is implement different, and uh, we're able to implement various accessories into directly into the stock. So there's no need for extra rails or anything like that. You can just it's kind of a plug and play system. You clip like a bipod into the front and you're ready to go. Um, another, <clears throat> another bonus of the X stock is that um, it, you, you're not limited to colors. We're going to, when we um, start making them, they're going to be done with an injection molding process, which allows you to do limitless colors, including different variations of camouflage and also. Um, well, I think that's on our next slide. So here's our weight advantage over this stock. Well, not over this stock, but over the current players right now. Okay. So these are all the different companies that make a popular aftermarket 1022 stock. Um, we are at least 40% lighter. 
than any other aftermarket stock that's out on the market. And compared to this, we're 60% lighter. We're well under a pound. Another thing that's cool about our stock is that it has an inherent recoil absorption property. How many of you shot like a 300 Weatherby that's got a, how'd you feel afterwards? Felt yeah, you felt it. <laughs> yeah, feel like you've been kicked, kicked, kicked by a mule. So what the x stock does is even though it's extremely lightweight, um, it's engineered in a way that it will um, absorb up to 25% of recoil. So this is an FEA analysis we had done on the stock. And this kind of shows you what happens when the stock is under, is under pressure, when, when it's put under a load. This up here, don't pay attention to that. It's, you know, it's not going to move that much. But as you can, this is a dramatization. But as you can see, as the time, by the time it gets to your shoulder, that 50 pound load is essentially zero. I mean, you're not going to fill it nearly as much. This is kind, this is the, this is the design. So we've got, this is the gun I, the stock I brought, if I get it out of the dang case. Um, but, so that, that's the design with the ISO grid pattern, and up here at the top left you can see the plug and play accessories. That piece will clip right into that triangle right there, and you're ready to go. Um, exploring, exploring potential markets. Um, we have to start in 98 because before then the FBI didn't record any firearm purchases. So from 98 to 2012, the FBI received 156 and a half million um, applications to purchase a new firearm. And 43 per, almost 44 percent of those were, were for rifles. Um, and after you take out people that were denied because of various reasons, most of them felonies, um, we have roughly 67 and a half million rifles that were legally sold in the United States from, to, from 98 to 2012. Um, another potential market and something that we're working on right now is working with, o with manufacturers. We're currently in negotiation with Remington. Um, to build them a stock. This is the stock that we've built for them right now. Um, they're going to they're gonna put that on their new air gun for 2016. Um, some, something a little different. Um, try and get in bed with Ruger and have them sell the X stock with, um, sell the 1022 with the, with the X stock on there. So for our market, um, what we've what we've seen is the aftermarket, the aftermarket gun stock business in a whole, it generates between 200 and 320 million dollars annually. Um, what we plan to do is we want to start with the 1022 and then launch into low, lower caliber rifles under, under a 243 and we plan to capture the market, at least 16 percent of the market. And that's it. I got it open. <laughs> All right. So there it is. So, sorry to take up your time. So that's that's kind of the idea right there, with the bipod and how it just directly is. You can insert it into the stock, and then this piece comes on and off, and then the legs will fold back and clip right in there. But. So did you design that? Yeah, this was, this has been, a des we've been working on it for a long time. Who, like, who have you been working with? It's been kind of a family project, me and my father-in-law. And I know, like, you were talking, I'm actually, that's super interesting, you've got, like, all the, the different people you want to, like, the end goal, or do you want to manufacture them to be able to sell them yourself? Or? Well, I think manufacturing, I think selling them at, 
selling them as an aftermarket piece is going to be the most lucrative way to do it. Um, anytime you're dealing with a big business or with retail stores, anything like that, it really starts to swallow up your your profit. And right now we have extremely good margins. Um, after we get our mold made, I can make this stock for eight bucks, and uh, we're going to sell them for around. So we have great margins. That eight bucks, that, that doesn't include packaging or anything like that, but get back. but still we have a lot of room to play with margin and so yeah. is that uh, like patentable? Yeah, this is all patented. You're right, okay. So cool. don't be stealing my bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so the design's patented. Um, the um, the plug and play accessories are all patented. So I think you did a really great job of going through a lot of those four questions. Um, four of the five questions I think you did really well. Um, the one I didn't see is kind of the cash flow and burn rate. Mm -hmm. uh, kind of, you know, how long have you been working on this and what have you spent so far? Mm -hmm. And what do you think it's going to take to get you to really a licensing deal or putting it on the shelf with Cabela's? Sure. So right now, um, we've been working on this for about three years and we've probably burned 150K. Um, most of that towards legal fees and, of course, R&D. But um, right now, to get us going, we're looking for an investment of around one hundred fifty dollars to $200,000 for equity. And with that money, we're going to you know, buy the molds that we need, and that will really launch the, after, the Ruger 1022 aftermarket cool. and get us going. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, I want you to know I was so nervous about this. I walked into the men's bathroom today. <laughs> so, so work with me here. Okay, I'm LaDonna Jensen, and I'm co-owner and co-founder of 12 Month Greenhouse. Oh, do you? Oh, that's okay. And if you guys, if you can't hear me in the back, let me know, okay? I am a fellow student here as well, and one of the reasons I came back to school was to get the marketing and business experience so that we could, my partner and I could develop and, and produce and manufacture the greenhouse. Um, oh, wait. Okay, so how do I get the next screen? Click? Okay, this is my business partner. He graduated from University of Utah in mechanical engineering. He has experience in machining. And before he became an engineer, he worked for a company that did drill presses, oil oil uh, drilling and he was in the machine shop as a high-tech machinist and they had a problem with the machine and so he was able to come up with a tool and this is before he was an engineer and the team of the engineers couldn't figure it out he did that and they are still using that tool today um, he has been in, in manufacturing and research and development the story is very simple he wanted to build a greenhouse with his father-in-law because he is allergic to wheat, he likes fr um, the fresh fruits and vegetables, eats very healthy, and when he built the greenhouse, they soon discovered in the winter months that it was too cold and had extreme e expensive heating costs. That's where our paneling system comes in. We do have two patent pendings on this paneling system. And I want to give it to you guys so you can look at that. We have tested the paneling system, and it has an R value that can save nurseries um, between 40 and 60% on the utility bills. Nurseries at this time spend an average of about $100,000 in utility, utility bills yearly, and we can cut that down significantly. Also, we spoke with, this is our dream, but uh, one of the nursery owners confirmed our vision in that they could increase, yeah, sure that they could increase their revenue by selling produce in the middle of winter. Can you imagine going into a nursery, walking in, and this is what this nursery owner said, this was their dream, to have people come into the nursery and pick the tomatoes right off the vine. That is what they can do with this. And that is not what is capable now without expensive heating costs. I'm going to show you a simulation, simulation of, now I hope it works, hope I can get to it okay. I need to open it up to... 
How do I do? I need help, guys. <laughs> I am technically challenged. I'm almost 60. Okay. I'm trying to show you simulation. If it doesn't work, that's okay. I can explain it without the simulation. So we got all these computer guys in here. That's great. There, it should now right click. It should. There we go. And open. I can't see without my glasses, but there we go. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Isaac. Yep. Okay, this, this is the um, physics behind it. It's, it's very simple. It's been, you know, if you've taken science classes, you probably do understand the science behind it. When we have, as you can see, you have, we have two polycarbonate panels. We have a support structure in between. What we do is we vacuum out the air. Air is a gas. And when we vacuum out the air, it changes the heat transfer. It keeps the heat from transferring out, okay? So when it goes back in, of course, you lose your insulation. It's the same concept as if you were to have insulation in your home. If you didn't have the pink insulation in your home, what would happen? The heat would go out. And it's expensive to heat. Okay, now, how do I get back? Let's see, I think I can do it here. Close that, right? There we go. Okay. Now, we're at the point we've tested our paneling system, we know it works. We've done the research and development. The next stage that we're at is building a full working size model. To prove our concept that the plants can grow, we need to test the plants within the environment. That is the next step, and that's what we're trying to raise money for, is to build the prototype. Our long-term goal, and this is not you know, a far-fetched idea, this is being done right now, but not with our paneling system not with our energy efficient insulated paneling system, is growing produce or plants on attics or attachment to a house. This would actually replace insulation in an attic that's currently being used and be able to help with the energy efficiency of the home. These are some of the costs that we have. You know, and Isaac, I'm so glad you said that in the beginning, you explained what you are looking for. The advantage that our company has is that we have very low costs. Because Lauren is an engineer and a programmer and a machinist, the part, there's a part on that panel that in um, developing that, he was able to design that, manufacture it, and put it on. So we can do that in-house without going out and having a prototype and spending thousands and thousands of dollars that way. And we are all about, we have put so little into this company to get to this point because we have those skills. Uh, marketing strategy, we've already been, begun some of that. I've already been in contact with national organizations, nursery organizations that have thousands of nurseries that they're in contact with. And I want to explain something too. Nurseries have more than one greenhouse. And they're large, they're not small. So the market is tremendous for us. Um, I've been working with garden clubs and speaking with the um, directors of garden clubs, and they're getting the information out. And we've been given, um, the national organization gave me contacts to magazines, national magazines, and how we could get our, an article in those magazines about our technology without having to pay marketing. Um, preppers, does anyone know what a prepper is? Okay, good, you do, okay, they're awesome. They're a group that are self learning self-reliance in case of an emergency. And this fits right in with the preppers. And I, met, I spoke personally with that director, and he had a radio station and has 300 following. And he sent an email out. The next day, I got contact from one of his preppers that had built a hydroponic greenhouse that had three sides that, that were enclosed, but had one side that he was losing all of the heat from and said, what can you do for me? I know this would work for my greenhouse. Um, social media, that's another huge, and website SEO. My partner and I, before we, we came back to school and did this, ha um, had a business in marketing, and, I, and we worked with small businesses developing websites and doing their, doing their search optimization in their marketing. So our cost, we don't have to spend thousands of dollars in marketing either. Our projection in our sales the first year, we would think 100. Now, that may seem like a lot, but it really isn't. And well, maybe not in the large scale of, of it. But if we can get into nurseries, it would be four to six 
small scaled um, greenhouses into one that they'd have. And an average nursery carries about 1,600 nursery, um, greenhouses within their nursery. And we, we projected a 20% increase every year thereafter. Now the last thing is what that boils down to in manufacturing cost is projected about $3,000. Um, selling price $6,000, a double 100% markup, and earning per unit $3,000. And using the chart below, before, um, the first year that would make a $300,000 profit the first year and within five years over half a million. Um, nurseries, like I said, have multiple greenhouses. The 2007 census of agriculture said that there were over two million structures or um, um, plants and nurseries that had plants in different types of growth within a structure nationwide. Now in 2012, that went up 15 to 21%. That's a huge growth. Areas, of course, that we would market and target market are areas with the colder climates. Okay? Any questions? Well, you know what? I'm, I'm done. I think, I, I think I've covered everything. So, uh, really quick, we'll turn the time over to um, the campus founders fund. And sure. And then after that, we'll open up the room for questions for um, both Blake and LaDonna. Actually, just kidding, just LaDonna's okay. class after we get okay. to their questions. So thank you, Lizanne. Oh, you're welcome. So how are you estimating your manufacturing costs? Well, I'll tell you. My son has manufacturing experience, and my other son works for a government, a company that does government. You guys are going to love this. He's a manager over a machine shop that does drones here in Utah County, government drones. And that's what he's been doing for 10 years, price per unit, the cost. We know how much the um, carbonates, um, the polycarbonate costs, and, and everything. We know all the machining expenses and everything. With several, about probably 20 years combined experience in manufacturing. And you said, so you had a list back there of uh, a uh -huh. couple of your expenses. Yes. And there's a CNC router, and mm -hmm. those are things you've already spent. Right? No, those are the things that we need. Okay. We've tested our panel. Now that's what we need. Now, to build the first greenhouse, what we could do, that would get us into manufacturing. We could, for the first greenhouse, get a supplier here in Utah, which we've already purchased from, to cut the pieces and wouldn't have to buy the router right off. Now, to go into manufacturing, we have to have the router. And $15,000 is pretty reasonable for a machine router. So why would you decide to do all the manufacturing yourself versus outsourcing it for right now? You and know, bring it back to yourself as you actually have that revenue stream. That is a great question, and that is an option for us. We're very open to. In fact, if we do manufacture ourselves, um, we our goal is to keep it down the cost as low as we can. So we would probably even bring polycarbonate out from China, but we'd like to keep the manufacturing in the United States. For, for some really obvious reasons, I think, you know, to protect us. And, yeah. Does that help? Yeah, and one of the things that we were th I was thinking about, too, just talking about your costs and stuff like that, like how much money would you say per month you're spending to keep going at the rate you're going at? You know what? We've hardly spent a thing. Okay, that brings up this point, our patents. We've already got two patents on this, this system. We have another patent we're sending in January, February that's going to help that even be more energy efficient. We, my son's an engineer. Um, we both studied the patent book, a 500-page patent book for a year, wrote our patents, and we are writing our own patents. He's studying to be a patent clerk and it may go back for, to be a patent lawyer. So we've got that ability. Very cool. So Keep our costs down. So what's your next step like if you were to get $20,000 from the Cameron Founders Fund or $100,000 from a yeah. seed fund or something else, what would you do with that money? And how does that get you to basically a customer? Good question. We need to build the greenhouse. We need to test it. We need to have the temperature control. We've got to prove that the, the plants will grow in that environment and that it is a, um, a very stable um, environment and our panels are stable. We've got to prove that. And in the meantime, we're going to continue to build relationships because we've already started to build relationships and that's what we'll continue to do. So what do you estimate is the cost of your first test greenhouse? That's what that, yeah, that's an estimate of the, some of the, I would say if we, it depends. If we just get the polycarbonate from the manufacturer, have them cut that, it would cut it down. I would say an estimate around 25, 30,000. Okay. Yeah. Very cool. Um, 
So the last thing I want to know, so you said it would cut energy costs by 40 to 60 percent, somewhere in there, I think mm -hmm. you said. Yes. Uh, what are those costs compared to if you're spending $25,000 for your test model, that's a long recouping cost for a nursery, right? If they're building multiple of these greenhouses, yes. they're investing half a million dollars in your greenhouses? Well, actually, and now the prototype's going to cost more because we have to have the testing equipment. That's why that's more expensive. The price on the greenhouse will go down because they won't need all that once it's, it's proven. Um, green, we've already had a greenhouse owner say, if you can prove this, I have 16 greenhouses I'll replace because I'm spending $100,000 a year in utilities. And he's the one that has the vision of, yeah, I want people to come in and just pull the tomatoes right off that's in the awesome. winter. Really quick thing. Um, I would say within five years they should recoup the costs. Yeah. That's wow. mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's something that nurseries really can like handle. That kind of like they're paying six thousand dollars for the greenhouse. That's what I'm guessing is the selling price. We're going to sell to mm -hmm. nurseries and like that. Based on I don't that's know what an the average. budget looks like for a nursery. Is that the kind of money that that market could drop? Pretty easily? That yes. Like Greenhouses have capital. That's a good market, and that's why we're going that market. And if, if they can not only save money in utilities, but be able to have revenue during the winter months that they previously have, haven't had, that's huge for them. It's huge. Yes. Oh, that's OK. So, so like, say in a really cold climate like Russia, yeah. if they go into their greenhouse, and then they click the three, and then it gets really cold again, what? No. No? No. no. It'll stay warm. We've got a, a temperature gauge. It's a thermostat controlled. We control the temperature. So we can keep it within a certain degrees. So let's say, you know, it opens up, you know, so little would be lost that we could get that heated up immediately. It would kick on the heater or kick on the, the taking it out. And the thing of it is there are situations they would need heat heater, but it would be very brief and it would maintain that heat. Does that answer it? Okay. No problem. No, the vacuum is out between the panels. So the air within the, the greenhouse stays the same. That's a good question. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So yeah, does anybody have any questions directly for us? Anybody building a business that they want to know something that they're thinking about pitching or how they should approach that? You, um, Richie. So I have a question. I just want to make sure I'm on the same page with you guys. Is this essentially a convertible note? Okay. Yes, so the funding is up to $20,000 and it's what's called a convertible note, which means that we're not trying to evaluate what your company is worth right on or right at the beginning. And so it's not, again, that shark tank of you give us 25% of your company and we'll give you $20,000. The convertible note basically evaluates the company as you grow and as you actually take more money from another investor. Um, so it's no cap, no discount, which basically means that it's really some of the nicest money you're ever going to find in the world, right? Besides getting grants, um, contest winnings, that kind of thing, it's really going to be easy money for any entrepreneur to take. You don't have to worry about your company being, you know, leveraged by us. Yeah, I mean, because there's, I mean, it is, so it's venture capital, so there is a trigger for when you raise a lot more money, then our money kind of gets put into play, but then there's no, like, maintaining, like, avoiding dilution for us or anything, so we're not going to get rich off of the investments that we make in you. We'll make enough to return our fund to continue investing in other people, but it's not like a lot of venture capital firms that are going <coughs> to take a portion of your company and then maintain that percentage throughout additional raises and stuff like that. So that's a good question. <clears throat> Any other questions, curiosities, feelings? I would like to know how many companies you funded today. How when did you start and how many companies you funded? Yeah, so we started, dang, when did we? We pitching? started in September. Yeah. Um, so like you said, we've seen about 30 companies come through and pitch. I'm guessing what's going to happen is we're going to fund probably three by January. So because we've just had a short lead time on that. Yeah. But the time frame, you come pitch to us. We have Monday night meetings where we hear three pitches a week. Um, within about, you'll find out at that meeting or within a week of that meeting whether or not we're going to continue to what's called due diligence and do more research on your product, the industry, answering these questions. After the due diligence, that will take us about four weeks and we fund. It's a really simple, quick note. 
um, get you the money as fast as you can so you can start using it. Yeah, and your odds are pretty good because I mean, out of the 30 companies we've seen, I think we've moved 10 to due diligence and we've got four that we're working on investing in. So those aren't bad odds at all. Is there another question over here? Yeah. I was gonna ask how you guys are selected to be like the members of this firm. Like, do you get that entrepreneurship experience or like what makes you guys like yeah. stand out about? Yeah. So we were interviewed. I mean, like the way I found out is that I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do with my life. I felt like venture capital was the direction I wanted to go, and I saw a sign at BYU that said, "Want to be a venture capitalist? Come to this meeting." So I did. I filled out the application. We went through an interview process where we actually did basically this. Uh, Kickstart brought us into some offices. They gave us one of their portfolio companies that they were working on right now in due diligence and just had us evaluate them right there. With, I mean, I didn't have any due diligence experience, but we just answered questions and they just wanted to see how we thought. And we actually, just so everybody knows, uh, out of the 10 of us, five of us are graduating in April, so we're gonna have to replace half of our team. So if you wanna do what we do, you should talk to us. Hi. Yeah, so go to the website, email us. Um, yeah. Get my card. Get the card. Get my card. But we're also throwing up a newsletter page. I think it was supposed to go up last night. It should be going up in the next two or three days. So if you want to find out those times of when we're going to start doing interviewing, I need to replace myself. We're in charge of replacing ourselves. Yeah. So I would like to have a UVU person replace me if you're interested in that, if that's something that's cool to you. Um, yeah, but if I can't too. get anybody to come interview, then I guess I'm going to BYU. I'll replace Sorry. myself with a UVU student if I come. I don't care. Just come talk to us. <laughs> If you come get his card, he will replace it with the interview.